Great. Well, thank you and welcome. Um, it is a delight here to be uh, asked by the Rabbit Show to talk on um, a very unique breed, the Rhinelander. And um, when I was asked and to present on this, my name is Scott Wiemenzone. I'm an, an Arba judge. And uh, I thought it would be only um, best to include um, a breeder. And one of our key breeders, in, in my opinion, uh, that lives close and nearby and you know I've known for so many years is uh, Susan Londy. And uh, so for those of you who don't know Susan, Susan's a, a judge uh, with the ARBA. And she's also been a Rhinelander breeder along with a full arch um, breed breeder um, for well over a decade. Uh, and so um, Susan, can you share us also, also a little bit some of your accomplishments in the breed? Um, I've won two best of breeds at the Arbor Convention. One was with the blue um, and I've just, I've been breed, breeding and culling like crazy. Um, I'm delighted to see how our breed has improved from the time I started in 2009 to now. So. Excellent. Well, thank you, Susan. And um, this is just a, you know, we're going to be up here in the left hand corner, but I'm going to probably minimize us maybe until we actually do the, the questions and answer aspect. Um, so if you have any questions, um, I know David's going to be monitoring any of those that you can actually put inside the chat. Uh, the way this is going to um, sort of be outlined is we're going to share some of the, the key elements about the Rhinelander, the evolution and the history for a little bit. Um, we're going to break apart some key aspects of the Rhinelander breed according to the ARBA standard of perfection. And then we're going to have some videos and we're going to talk through some of these videos, but it's going to be a co-presentation. We're going to try to make it a um, sort of like a conversation and um, hit some of the key things that are going to be upcoming in the next standard too. So to move forward, I was going to point out too that um, I, I want to send kudos out to Susan for designing this presentation. Uh, so I've seen her present before and, you know, here's a prime example of, you know, what we're looking for with the Rhinelander breed. But before we jump into the breed that it is today, we have to really think about the history. Uh, so this is a great overall timeline. And um, I've uh, known of Rhinelanders mainly because of um, growing up in Wisconsin and, and Marty Adams. And so she was someone I'd always see at the shows back in the 80s and she would have Rhinelanders. Um, and so prior to you know um, the current uh, millennium, the Rhinelander itself uh, looks a bit more cobby and it, while it was a full arch breed, um, it ran and they were a little bit more parallel with the table. So they were judged um, and still ran, but there's just quite a bit of evolution that we'll, we'll show. And you can see that, you know, in five years, the best breed of the convention um, had a bit more curviness and shape to that top line. And then it's, you know, completely um, become much more profound in the, the breed itself. But at the same time, that's without the um, hard work of many individuals. So uh, I would actually going to just uh, point out, you know, Joanne Purpose, she had recently, um, uh, I know that there was some news that she had just recently passed. And so that individual was a, was a key individual in the breed, is in, also in the Hall of Fame, along with other people in the Rhinelander um, club. And the one unique thing about the Rhinelander was that uh, in the record books and the ARBA standard, it was recognized back in the 1930s, but then it lost interest or disappeared and also disappeared out of the book. And so then it was reintroduced back in the 1970s. And so uh, that's sort of the, you know, the, the lost story, I would say, about Rhinelanders. Uh, and so moving forward, though, a little bit about that, um, I want to recognize some of the, some of the key people, um, Lorena Prashad has been a huge advocate for the breed. Um, I also think very good things about Evelyn and Gordon Halsey. And so there's many other people uh, without naming everyone that have done wonderful things in promoting this breed and making it um, very much a best in show contender of today. Susan, okay, do you want to? So, Go ahead, um, Susan. The, okay. So we um, started out with blacks and just recently in 2011, 
the blues have been accepted. Um, Lorena Frashad held the COD for them and they were accepted in Indianapolis. And the blues have been done quite well. Um, we've had several that have won best in show at the Arbor Convention. Yep. And I can talk about this just briefly, uh, but Susan has the specifics because Susan was on the standards, um, the Rhinelander Standards uh, Committee for the club. Uh, so moving forward, looking forward to the next standard, um, point one is the spine marking has a new definition and, and a much of a more clear um, uh, disqualification. So it's very similar to the wording in the Checker Giant standard where the spine marking shall be continuous from the ear base all the way down to the tail. That's the base of the tail. Um, and then the width shall balance then with the appearance of the other markings. Uh, and it also cannot have more than one um, break in there. So, um, and then the second one, it talks a little bit about, there was some further distinction about the bone in the animals and also then the length of limb with additional faults specifically stating for pinched legs, finer bone and then weaker ankles, uh, and that's on the front feet. Okay, so the, um, the breed is divided into three major parts and it's types, color, and markings. And then we have five points for the fur and condition. And um, we have taken some points away from things for the next um, standards of perfection. And so you will be seeing that. Thank you, Susan. And I, I really think of uh, uh, that as one of the, the key elements in, in judging this breed. It, it is more difficult to really evaluate it because when you're balancing three different elements um, that the mind and the eye have to see in a moving animal. So um, it is a challenging breed. So, um, but kudos to the members in the clubs for defining that. And so um, we do transition to body type. It is worth 36 points. And, you know, there's a key um, group of full arch rabbit breeds um, that include, of course, we know the English spot, the checker giant, um, the Belgian hare, the Britannia petite, uh, and um, the Rhinelander, of course. And so um, here it's a description, right? But there's a lot we're gonna be showing in the video. So really be describing and showing the type. Um, there's something you can read in words, but then seeing it in a live animal is the key element in determining what makes a Rhinelander type, Rhinelander type. Okay, here's a, a, a good type animal. Um, she has strong shoulders. She's very smooth over the top. Her hindquarters are just a little bit off the ground. She has very nice front leg extension, very strong ankles. Um, you can see daylight under her belly. Um, just a, a well-rounded rounded animal. And even one more thing to point out, not only do you see the daylight underneath the belly, you see the daylight underneath those back feet. And so that's a a great element um, and complement to this animal. And here um, in comparison, we have um, an animal that is more parallel or angular in its overall body type. It does not really have an arch. It is more um, like a trapezoid where it's pretty flat here. And then there's a key point right near the pin bones and it angles down. It might even undercut just a little bit. So this is just the key um, top line description um, of comparing um, an animal from to the left here, then to the right. Okay, tracking is very, very important with the Rhinelanders, um, actually any running breed. And um, I've had uh, meat animals and I do run them on the table too. The tracking, um, when they track well as the ra rabbit on the left, um, it shows the fullness of the hindquarters. If they're narrow or um, cow hawk like on the right, they're gonna be pinched, they're gonna be undercut, they're not gonna have the full um, wide hindquarters that you would like to have. Absolutely, thank you, Susan. And I think the key thing is it's a healthy um, element of the animal to have that actual perpendicular um, hip and then also them that the feet to be parallel as the animal is running. So um, very good point and description here. So what we want to do here is we have a side by side uh, animals. And 
the one on the top, right, it actually is an animal that's moving more, more horse-like, more up and down and, and more of like in a rocking fashion at times. The one in the bottom actually is um, an animal that's going to be running downhill. It doesn't have enough extension of that front limb um, to really show itself off. So we're going to actually um, show these two videos here real quickly to demonstrate um, the differences between the two. So the top one, actually we'll show the bottom one first. I'm gonna show that one more time. Again, we see the animal, what's doing, it is running downhill. Um, and it does show some extension at the end, but we really wanna have those heads held up high. The second one here, a little bit longer video, a couple seconds longer. Let me make that full screen here. And here we have a rabbit that one, it's just curious, it's holding its head up high. And while it is curious and looking at some different areas, it's going to turn here and really just show more of that rocking appearance and then extending to that, that front limb and holding its head high versus an animal that's running downhill. So, and I guess one of the key things, and it's fantastic that Susan had a video of a self here, um, because of the fact is you're not distorted by the... Um, not distorted by the actual markings. And I think we picked about... There, there's a pretty good picture right there at my, um, second market 13. It's really showing that top line, even at an angle, lots of daylight underneath the, the belly here and a nice held up head high. So I'm gonna to toggle back to the presentation here. All right, here we go. And get back into present mode. Anything else you wanted to comment on that with Susan? No, no. Okay. All right, color and distribution. Um, this is 27 points. Um, and the thing is, we need to remember about the markings as they should be distinct, balanced, and well-defined. And so they want to be balanced from side to side. The spine markings, um, you want to orange, black, orange, black, or blue fawn, blue fawn, blue fawn. And the only marking that you don't have to have both colors on are the cheek spots. They can be all black or all orange or fawn or blue or whatever. So. And, and that's fantastic that you bring that up, um, Susan, because um, I do remember judging one time, and this wasn't at a national convention, um, but uh, I do remember uh, that there was an animal and it was distinctly uh, had some great markings on it. And it had more than three spots in the side pattern, but unfortunately um, they were all the same color. So I unfortunately had to disqualify it. So um, that's one of those unique things that we have to take into consideration when we're dealing with color and distribution. But as we transition into the, the fault aspect of it, the standard talks about various different brindling um, and brindling is an intermixing of colors. So this animal, um, again, we're using some self animals here just to really show off the color as much as possible. There's not a lot of um, separation of coloration here. It's just a lot of brindling, a lot of mixed coloration throughout it. The animal on the right here has distinct separation of color that then actually um, amplifies the overall intensity of that coloration too, to show that sharp contrast of coloration. Okay, color faults. Um, you want the, the black and the blues and the orange and the fonts to be deep and dark. And so the um, picture on the right, or the left, I'm sorry, is very faded. That's a black. He almost looks blue. There is a little bit of brindling in his coat. And the one on the right has a very nice distribution of color. It's very deep orange. It's deep black. It stands out. It's a very clean marked animal. Yeah, absolutely, Susan. Wonderful uh, remarks there. And that, again, we're just focusing on the color aspect of this animal. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the specific faults um, that may actually um, separate these two in addition to the color faults um, along the markings in future in the presentation. But here we have um, the overall color disqualification. The only real color disqualification besides the um, cheek spot um, being the only uh, marking 
that has to have uh, can have one or the other color is in it is actually the fact that sometimes an unshowable color pops up. The animal right here on the left is actually um, it's a torted um, it's a torted tri, so it's a torted Rhinelander. Um, I've only seen these a few times ever, um, but the color is supposed to be like the second and third pictures here, uh, where it has clean color and it also has both colors present on. Um, all markings except the cheek spots. Okay, and um, Scott kind of talked about this a little bit at the beginning, is this rabbit um, only has blue on her side. And so she would need one more spot, an orange spot, or she's actually blue, um, a fawn spot somewhere. Um, so this is a disqualification. And again, um, only the cheek marking is the one the marking that needs only one color, but everything mm -hmm. else, the ears, the butterfly, the eyes, the spine, the side markings all need both colors. Mm -hmm. And and Susan, the, uh, this is a unique picture because it's not only a marking disqualification, it's also a color disqualification too. So um, yeah, so that's, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, we have this as an example to talk about. Uh, so the markings themselves per the ARBA standard, they're broken down um, but as a whole, it's, you know, 27 points. And the one thing to point out, I, and talking about any mark breed, is um, an animal is not going to win or lose on any one of these um, specific markings. Just because it's lacking a little bit of roundness of cheek spots, or maybe is a little bit dirtier by the ears, or lacks just a little bit of balance, judges should be taking into consideration the entire mark animal um, when they're evaluating these 27 points, even though it is broken down in this fashion. So um, that's one time. One thing I, I try to uh, point out to younger um, judges in reference to their career in judging. So um, it's an animal should not be really, really downgraded because it's got a blunt um, like nose for it. Because that's only three points within the 27 total points. If it at least has a butterfly, you still have to give it at least one point. If it's got a decently sharp butter shaped butterfly, two points. And so. But the best thing is about the standard is that it's by comparison. Okay, I have three pictures here on the side markings. Um, the first picture on the left is very well marked. She's a little bit barred. You know, if, if I could fix her, I would make those um, spots just a little bit rounder. The second one is very heavy, very barred, and I guess something I need to say, if all the colors were together and there were spots within the color, to have the spots count, they have to be separated by white. Mm -hmm. So um, that is something to remember. And then our um, third rabbit on the, the, the right is lacking marking. And she's the one that we just saw. Um, she needs one more spot to um, be good to go. And, and Susan, we're just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a curveball out here. Um, let's just say the animal on the far right over here actually did have a nice fawn spot um, right in the center of the hip. Um, where would you place, would you place um, that animal higher or lower than the one that was barred um, in the middle there? I would place it higher. Uh, on what justification? Because the markings would be cleaner. Um, it does state that they need to be round, like about the size of a quarter or an inch in diameter, where the one uh, in the middle is just very heavy, it's barred, it's splotchy, it almost looks a little um, brindled. So it's just the one on the right is cleaner. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. I would agree with you 100%. And you're, you're throwing some great um, terminology out there. You know, spot by definition in the ARBA standard is color separated by um, by white spot should be round um, and then barred is um, what I really understand it to being is it's sometimes more than one spot connected um, or uh, and these could be of the same color or different colors um, for the Rhinelander breed so um, that's where there's some congestion going on so thank you for uh, answering it in that fashion and so we have some Disqualifications. We've we've talked about number one, less than three spots. Uh, also, any spots on the front leg, and again, this actually has to be 
you can feel that spot. You can see that's on the leg. If you're unsure, if you're a judge, actually grab that and make sure that you're on the leg and not feeling the shoulder. And here we have um, uh, two unique things where any spots on the shoulder um, for this rabbit on the right here, these, these two, the definition states that it has to be, um, if it's within one inch of the spine, that's a fault and, and not ideal. Um, they should have a clean shoulder, but if it's um, a spot right here, then that is a, a major, major um, flaw in, um, in the Rhine leather. They should much look closer to um, at least the shoulder of the animals on the left here. Anything else to comment on this, Susan? Um, no, the, the one with the shoulder spot is a disqualification. So, Thank you. I, I don't know. That didn't sound clear, but yeah, it is definitely disqualification. Excellent. Thank you for making sure we get that point across here today. Okay, spine markings. So as the standards read today, is they, the spine should start narrow at the neck and then widen out to three quarters to an inch and then narrow at the tail. And so um, we've changed it a little bit and it doesn't really say that. Um, so the first animal is pretty nice. It, it doesn't narrow at the tail or narrow at the neck, but it does um, have some nice, clean orange, red, orange, red, orange, red down throughout. So the middle picture is herringbone. It is very ragged. It's a fault. It does narrow at the neck and it does narrow at the tail, but um, I would fault it for being very herringbone. And our third picture, it, that's a break in the spine. And I should have put a, uh, a ruler up to it because the break can only be a half an inch or less. And you can only have one break. If you have two breaks, it's a disqualification. And um, I'm glad you have that photo in here too, Susan, because this is an animal, depending when it was get shown um, and the age, of, age and size of the animal, it might have been able to have uh, passed the, the standards uh, definition, the old standard, but the new standard, this is definitely um, a disqualification. And so, um, and knowing how animals breed with uh, spine markings, this is a key thing that breeders want to weed out along with the herringbone effect as we're stating in the middle picture. So uh, kudos to the um, Rhinelander breeders and the club for getting that passed um, and getting that implemented in the next standard. So uh, the butterfly, right? Although it's only three points, there's so many things that can happen. Um, we have an animal here on the left where um, it does, you can see a good butterfly overall aspect. This is like the head of the butterfly and then the wings. And the wings should actually loop and, and, and they should end up on the side of the um, mouth, right? It should not be on the lower lip aspect. Um, and then the middle picture here is an animal that's got um, just a fine nose fork and a pretty decent roundiness to the, the right side of the, the wings of the butterfly. But then it's got a huge section of that um, butterfly where it's missing. It also does not have, there has very little black, if any black on there. So that would be um, a color flaw. And then the animal right here, although it's a little bit fuzzy, this is a, um, it's actually a, um, a baby checker giant and actually has got a white spot in the tip of that nose. Susan, you want to talk a little more about the white spots in the nose? Yes. As a breeder, um, I would call that because I had the sire of this little buck and um, he had like five white hairs on his nose and each generation that spot on their nose got bigger and bigger and bigger. And for the middle rabbit, the sire had um, a little white going up his lip. And so this is what he started to throw each generation, it got worse. So you have to really be mindful about what you're gonna keep. And if you see some of these flaws, you know, you can breed them, but um, be aware that they might pop up in a bigger way. Yeah, and my my years of, of breeding English spots, I can you know relate on um, and resound those same statements that you're talking about in your breeding program there, um, Susan. Um, and I you know still restate that a statement for a long time is that whatever you're keeping is what you're considering to be ideal. So if you're keeping animals with white spots in the nose or irregular shapes to their butterfly, 
that's what you're considering and wanting to produce more of. So weave that out and improve uh, the butterflies through all, throughout your entire herd. Okay, um, cheek spots. So the cheek spots should be round um, and not barred. Um, you want cheek spots on both sides. It's a disqualification if you don't. And the one on the right has a double cheek spot. And the definition for this, um, you know, I've heard some discussions, you know, what really is a double cheek spot? And as defined in the standards of perfection, it's two spots that are um, basically the same size and very close together. So mm -hmm. that's your double cheek spot. Yep. So I think, again, it's, you know, um, one spot as round as possible, um, right in the whisker bed, right where the whisker comes out. So there's a whisker bump. And so that's where that should be located. So um, very easy. Just the key thing for judges is that make sure you see that it's there. There's sometimes rabbits that don't have them that exhibitors are trying to pass through um, that, you know, maybe they weren't aware of it because it's so common for everything to have two, but please be, you know, uh, attentive for that marking. The um, ear markings are pretty straightforward. You want to have colored ears on a white head. Um, and the main thing is you just want to make sure that the, the coloration of the eye circle does not bleed into a dirty ear base and connect at any point. And again, um, you want to make sure that you're separating uh, the, you're making a judgment decision as to whether if there is a spot that's that's colored and surrounded by white um, that is on the head versus on the ear. What I do, um, while there is the pencil method, I actually just feel that area. If I feel it's on the cartilage of the ear, it's on the ear, even at the base. If it's on the skull, then it's a head spot. If it's anywhere on the cartilage, then it's um, on the ear. So that's that's my um, interpretation of the standard. Anything you wanted to add on, on this, Susan? No, no, okay. just don't breathe the head spots. Agreed. Okay, eye circles. Um, you want an even distribution of color. So the first picture, this doe has both colors, but it's not a very even distribution. Um, and a disqualification is any anything like the nose fork or the ears connecting with the eye. And so the um, rabbit on the right has his cheek spots are connecting with the eye circle. And the color is really poor. It's very faded. Um, the eye circle is not complete. It's, it's um, a very kind of a poor example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great photos here, um, Susan. Thank you very much for providing those. Um, some unique things here, right? Some things that you're, when, you, when you're judging, you're looking, you're like, oh, I got to look in the book to make sure this is or isn't okay. Uh, belly spots, that happens um, right along the, the nipples of the rabbits. Uh, spots in a dewlap and or then um, dirty um, haunches, right, or spots on the hind legs. Uh, so the one thing I want to point out that just disregard the belly spots, right? That just happens in, you can see that in almost any of the, um, the, the marked breeds uh, that are also in the running uh, category, the full arch category. The one thing here, this dewlap is just fine. Um, if it were to be like on the lower lip or on the neck, um, well, I guess say if it's, if it's on the head, right? Because if it's more than one head spot, that's still the head. The dewlap is a part of the neck and that is not a um, head spot. So that's one thing that we want to point out. And then um, at least we want to have the, the dirty, we, want, we don't want to have dirty haunches in the back. We want them clean, but it's very difficult to breed out the, the spots way down at the base of um, the, the hind hock. So the key thing is, is trying to breed a nice clean path of the spine marking as it connects with the, the base of the tail. More things on this, Susan? No, that was good. Okay. Okay. All right. As judging, um, for an, a, an exhibitor, you know, standpoint, this is going to take time for you to judge these classes because especially the youngsters, they don't move very well. And a lot of times I'll throw another one. If there's one that moves well, I'll throw one on to move with a, another one. But just step back and take your time. Don't poke them. Um, I know some of the rabbits 
will run left first and some of them run right first. So kind of give them a chance to get oriented in the table. Mine like to run left first and it's just where my running table is to my cages. Scott? Yeah, um, thanks Susan. And so um, here is the, the juncture in the presentation where um, we have some videos and it's there. Um, we, we have some kind of um, Rhinelander breeders um, who have provided some videos. So I'm going to start off with this video. Um, and these don't have audio. We might play them once or twice. So here's a, a pretty, let me get that a little bit bigger. Just back that up a little bit. Maybe there's a clear photo in here. So, um, I mean, I could start off a little bit um, as we have this video. This rabbit was running, um, and it, you know, it looks like it's toward the best in show um, table here today. It's it's moving well. It seems to be tracking pretty well, but it's hard for me to really tell if it's tracking extremely well because I almost have to lean over from behind the animal. Uh, to see how its hind legs actually um, land on the table. But I think this judge is doing a really good job right here, uh, just not handling it too much and just turning the animal when it's time for it to be turned. So that's sort of just some proper etiquette when you are um, the person or the judge actually running the rabbits on the table. Um, so we've had some breeders uh, send us some um, some animals here. Here's a good rear view of that rabbit. You can see it's got great tracking. Good hindquarter. Susan, how else would you comment on this rabbit? I'll probably restart this video too. Um, this rabbit has beautiful front leg extension. He actually gets way off the table. It moves nicely. Um, it almost looks like he's running downhill, but I just think his hindquarters are so big and strong that it it kind of makes him look that way because when he sets up he's gorgeous yeah and i could agree with you um on, on most of those points sometimes an animal might think it looks like it's running downhill and sometimes they're just relaxing and they haven't really um you know gotten up to the speed that they want to go and and use those front limbs to their full um ability but yeah this is a wonderfully typed animal and it moves extremely well um, on the table Minimize here. Seems like this is a younger rabbit here. Um, and again, we're really focusing on the type aspects of them. Susan, how would you comment on, on this animal and its overall movement and type? Um, this this one is a nice animal. Um, he's got some very nice shoulders. He does track well. You know, that moment we did see him track, he does have very nice front leg extension. This is, this too is a nice animal. I really like him. Yeah. And, and the key difference between the last video and this one is um, a judge doesn't need to have uh, a lot of, and the animal doesn't have to move very far to, for you to really evaluate and see that animal really stretch and show that, uh, that front limb and that have that nice smooth top line. I mean, I could probably just back it up to, if I pause it right there, um, here you have a rabbit that's just, and it seems like it's probably a younger rabbit, but it's got a great overall shape of that top line, superb overall depth underneath um, the midsection. And it's probably got an inch to inch and a half um, of daylight underneath those those hindquarters too. So um, that's just a wonderful way to evaluate um, the Rhinelander, let alone any full arch rabbit breed. Something uh, that mm -hmm. I was told is we're not watching them run, we're waiting for them to stop and pose. And so um, that's, um, you know, when they run, we're really evaluating their markings and their color. And we, we do look at how they move and they track. But we're waiting for that second where they pose and, and it may be just a second. Absolutely. And, you know, you mentioning that too, Susan, um, reminds me of a story too. 
um, where uh, just because like a Britannia Petit will, you know, hold a pose or um, a Rhinelander or an English spot, anything will run, right? It doesn't necessarily mean it's a good animal. Uh, I mean, we can have a New Zealand that'll pose and that's the same correlation that you're saying toward um, the Rhinelander here, but it's also being structurally correct and, and showing itself off in line with the standard. So um, wonderful, wonderful remark there. Uh, I could probably watch this animal uh, run quite a little bit longer and we could keep evaluating it. Um, but if I were to, we've, wait, we've watched this one now. If I were to jump back and we were to then, let's watch this rabbit one more time. I'm going to jump it back to the beginning. And we've just seen other rabbits run. And we could see a little bit of differences, differences in this rabbit where um, it's not holding its head up as high. Um, it's just at times running down downhill a little bit, but that's sometimes because of a rabbit, uh, they might be smelling the carpet um, or it can be older. Sometimes a, um, some Rhinelander uh, bucks might shorten a little bit and wind out in their shoulders and not carry themselves up as strong as they did when they were um, maybe a younger animal. Uh, but you see, while it does have some roundiness, it doesn't have that extreme overall um, length of that body type, but then also show as much daylight underneath the shoulders and the midsection. So um, it's still, there's some good qualities about this animal, uh, but I'm just really just showing different ways of how the animal is moving. Any other key things to point out on this, uh, this video, Susan? No, he, he's just lacking a little presence. You know, he's not showing himself off. He's more, he's a little bit more busy about smelling things. Totally understood. Yep, great points on that. And let's, and hopefully we can hear this, the audio on here. Um, we wanna save some time for some uh, questions, uh, but the key thing here is uh, Susan actually um, did a, a little recording for a litter and so evaluating some younger animals this way. So let me if I can get this to pop up and make it and hopefully we can hear Susan, Susan's recorded voice. So um, we might stop this a little bit early, but um, we'll try to get this playing and we'll present some time for questions or um, other things we can talk about along the Rhinelander breed. Short. 
So again, thank you, Susan, for um, sharing, uh, and I guess an evaluation of Rhinelanders at a young age, right? And it must be, um, you know, I, I think Susan is trying to share that if you feed your rabbits just a little bit of ribbon, right, they'll be, you know, contenders at the national level. So um, that's her secret that now is on a video and, and we're willing to share it that way. So um, Susan, thank you. The, the purple ribbons are the best. <laughs> Well, we got to have fun with it, right? And add fiber, you know, fabric and fiber to their diet that way. So um, we can gladly talk more um, uh, on the Rhinelander. Um, I do want to just make sure that we are um, providing time for for questions, if there's any specific questions. Um, otherwise, we could talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the other key judging aspects or some experiences that I've had. So do we have any questions? Uh, <clears throat> one question I have, and then definitely going into your uh, experience is good, uh, but um, when you are judging a large class of Rhinelanders, uh, what would you use like as your first cuts or what makes it in that first cut? What immediately goes into your uh, holding coops behind you as you know that it's going to be one of the top five or top top animal in the class? So, um, yeah, that's a great question. And I'm actually going to grab back over here to try our best to use the animals that really stand out. Um, so, yeah, when, I mean, when I'm evaluating a big class, um, uh, I'll usually look one over, make sure, make just look over for general disqualifications. Uh, and then I'll actually have somebody on the side. Um, let me even do this right over here. So you can... Um, I'll have somebody that is maybe behind the table with me too. So I'll have my briefcase um, and that animal will be able to stretch out and run and really show itself off. So um, then I'll just alternate animal after animal and the animals that really stand out right away. One, they're going to probably have, you know, superb body type. Um, that's number one. Uh, and so that's where if I have coops behind me, then I'll put those up in the top so they can stretch and relax. Uh, but then uh, on occasion, then there's those animals that are just wonderfully marked. And so um, because the animal is broken into sort of three different, three different categories, um, the color is sort of what then pushes both of those areas um, for an animal to then be pushed into the, the top 10 um, and top five, where it's got a compromise between all of those and not just really good in one category. So that's how I've, I've done it when I've, you know, judged Rhinelanders on the national um, level. 
Uh, but it takes an extreme amount of focus is what my statement is because you are looking at type. All right, I got that. I feel really good about that. I'm looking at markings, okay. Just making sure I'm not placing an animal that's got its qualification. The most difficult aspect is, is then making sure that there is an even distribution and brilliance and brightness and clarity of color in every other marking. That is probably the hardest thing that the brain has to do while animals are moving on a table. I do you need further agree. clarification or another question? Susan, were you gonna add on that or? No, that's um, perfect. <laughs> I, I did. I thought it sounded great too. I was. I, I was just curious. Um, so, <clears throat> when you have that that top, those top ones that come out, I mean, it it is that it's the the type aspect as well as obviously it has the markings. Um, but like, how, I mean, how do you know beyond that? that you're just like, man, this is this. I know this one's gonna go breed best of breed today. Oh, uh, I mean. Once in a while, there's an animal that really has the, you know, that it factor. Um, I mean, there's, there's tiny little things within type that will separate animals. Um, I mean, and there's a coat condition aspect. I think those are the easier things. But if you have two animals that are both in, in prime, well-muscled, well super condition, um, I think there's an element where um, – color ends up being um, at least a deciding factor for me because color varies so much in um, being a you know like a, a duller um, fawn on a black and when it should be a black and orange um, or the the distribution um, of color so that color definition um, is not only the actual intensity of the color but it's also then um a combination with the markings. So there's a blending between those two where the markings have to have a brilliance in color and have intensity of color. So there's a lot of hand in hand. So um, it's hard to really say what it is, but you do have to justify it in your statements. And so uh, I, I don't have a prime example as to one versus the other, but I do remember one time, uh, while it is like a pet peeve of mine as a breeder to place an animal that has like a head spot, um, for one of the top awards, it is only a flaw. And um, that that is uh, one of the key things that happened when I was judging the last time at the national convention where um, the winner had a head spot, it wasn't huge. I basically have to sort of put that flaw out of my mind, even though I know as a breeding animal and as a breeder uh, of marked rabbits, that's, that's sort of a no-no. But at the same time, the standard allows for it to be a flaw just as if it was weaker in color or lacking clarity or maybe not as strong in type and so a tough decision but the animal is the one that's going to best represent the breed when it goes for best in show table so um there's some judgment calls there so great question anything else you want to add on add on my add on my response there susan um presence there is i actually breed for presence you know if the babies come out of the nest box the ones that show themselves off right away and I know which ones they are those are the ones that stay so I guess as judging if I have two equal rabbits if I have one that's showing itself off a little bit better than the other I think it'll show itself off better for best in show mm -hmm. so that would be where I would go after we look at the colors and the distribution of the markings and the body type it's present and um, while the word presence isn't actually in the standard anywhere, I mean, movement is, but animals that have, that are structured correctly, right? If they got the correct curvature of, of, of top line, the correct overall extension of limb um, and correct overall bone, they should move. And um, it's much more comfortable to be moving in that fashion. So um, there's a, there is, yeah, there's a, sh there's a showiness. There's a presence once in a while. There's an if factor that is, uh, not necessarily ever written, you know, in, in the Rhinelander standard. So, um, cool. Great response there. Thank you for uh, chiming in with that, Susan. Have any more questions, David? So on a lot of other marked breeds, one of the, uh, one of the things that a lot of judges will say is that 
having that short snappy fur is is important. Is a shorter coat preferred on a Rhinelander, or what? What's your guys' opinion on on length of fur and how the fur looks? Susan, you want to tackle this one first? I'm going to review the standard. Oh, okay. Um, a shorter coat will make the markings a little bit crisper looking. And so um, you don't want a real short and snappy like, a, um, say, a silver, but um, you want it, you know, not real long like a beverage either. So it, um, a shorter coat is just going to make those markings and colors just crisper and stand out a little bit better. And I would agree with that, um, you know, what, where is it too short? Um, and I think it's less of a discussion there. Um, and it's more the fact of your faulting animals that do have the long coat, because that will um, create the coat to have like a fuzzy appearance. Um, the uh, side pattern will have much more of a feathered appearance too, as if you it more has like bre uh, brush strokes um, on a canvas. And I would say though, I've, I've handled animals from, from other countries that do focus and have a much shorter coat than we do have in the United States um, and our neighboring countries. Uh, so that does intensify the color of it. So um, there's got to be a happy medium on that. But um, I think the key element in that conversation and that answer is that we should be faulting animals with long coats. That's the key aspect. The, my experience, I've had the opportunity to judge at two national conventions and I've judged a, a spring national too. Um, and it's a couple things where the equipment has to be there um, that's, that's available for, that, I guess that complements um, a running breed. So I think the having that available for Rhinelanders will help them succeed and be on the table. And then um, having coops allowing them to relax, but then also not spending too much time running them because they can tire out. Um, but just giving an equal opportunity for all the animals to present themselves, follow the standard and, and just not over and overemphasize one area and really take the, the, all the ingredients that make the pie, right? If we're building a Rhinelander, um, you know, uh, pie, we need to, you know, take one, you know, a percentage of it being the color, a percentage of it being the markings, having it be on the type and then throwing a really nicely muscled and um, coated animal uh, that moves fluidly on the table is just the key aspect there. So um, I'd be delighted to, um, you know, if, if I'm ever in person and, and you know, you want to learn more about the Rhinelander breed, I also encourage people to speak with Susan and any of these other people that we've mentioned. Um, but also to, to point out one thing too, we wanted to end with uh, that the Rabbit Show was kind enough to um, uh, offer a monetary fund for um, our time and, and the organization that, that Susan put into this presentation. But we wanted to give that money um, to the Rhinelander Club. And so hopefully they can then utilize those funds and then also uh, maybe be a future award um, to help out with the heritage breeds and really push people to raise more Rhinelanders. So any other final remarks uh, or anything we wanna talk about else, Susan? No, I think that covers it. Well, this is a fantastic breed, um, and I highly encourage people to, of all ages to, to get them. Uh, and um, thank you very much to The Rabbit Show for, for hosting us. And we wish everybody only the best uh, for the remainder of the year and, you know, the many years from now. So hope to see you at the shows.